About a year ago, I took part in a study at Columbia University to determine if my experience as a jazz improviser affected the way that my brain processed music. We often talk about music assuming we all hear music in the same way, but it's interesting to note we don't make the same assumption about language. If you don't speak a language, how could you possibly understand it like a native speaker does? So why is music any different? The study was recently published in Psychology of Music, and I got the chance to sit down with two of the people that studied my brain. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Goldman. <laughs> I'm Dr. Tyreek Jackson. How's it going, man? Good to How see you. How you doing? I went to school with Tyreek, by the way. He is an awesome bass player. Jazz. Uh, so the paper is called Improvisation Experience Predicts How Musicians Categorize Musical Structures. Basically, we found that people with more experience improvising categorize different chords that have the same musical function as being more similar to each other than chords that have different functions. The people with less experience improvising, the different chords, it didn't matter whether they were functionally similar or not. Different was different. We're very interested in what we call like information processing, right? So how they're understanding what it is that they're interfacing with. Understanding French is difficult if you don't speak the language. Your prior experience improvising in the French language, your prior experience speaking French, governs how you will listen to French. That idea makes sense, at least to me, but how would you go about testing this idea, at least when it came to music? You look at different people doing a similar task, and you see what about their improvisation experience makes them perceive differently. We do what's called an oddball experiment. We had different uh, musicians come into the lab and listen to a series of chord progressions. These were these three, three chord chord progressions. And then we also had inversions of those chord progressions. Now and then we would substitute one of the chord progressions with a different chord progression. Either uh, a substitution of the same harmonic function. So in other words, instead of two, five, one, we would play them two, five in first inversion one. Or we would substitute it with another kind of difference, which is two, four, one. Just for fun, let's recreate the experiment. You're going to hear a couple of chord progressions where the chords have an inner onset interval of about 400 milliseconds. Every so often you'll hear a chord progression where the second chord has changed. This, by the way, will be a super subjective, non-scientific demonstration. The actual study was a lot more rigorous. You can measure how fast and accurate people are at detecting the deviance, and that gives us an index of how easy it is for them to detect. We also measure brain signals that correspond to the detection of deviance. We didn't tell them that there were two deviants. We didn't tell participants anything other than the fact that they need to respond as quickly and as accurately as possible. I often like to make this analogy with chefs, that a chef following a recipe that calls for lemon juice, but they don't have any lemons, but they realize that the reason the recipe calls for lemons is because it needs something citrus or something acidic, and so they use limes instead. So by analogy in our study, what they would hear would be like lemon, 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 lime. So lime is like a within category difference. Lemon, 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 banana. Or banana is something that's functionally unrelated. So you'll first hear a steady stream of lemons, the standard, a 2-5-1 chord progression. But at a certain point, you might hear the auditory equivalent of a lime, the exemplar deviant, where the second chord, the 5 chord, has been shifted into first inversion but retains the same harmonic function. At another point, you might hear the auditory equivalent of a banana, the function deviant, where the second chord doesn't have the same function and instead is now a 4 chord. Are you ready? Oh, and one more thing. The chord progressions are going to be shifting keys every time, so you won't be able to orient yourself around a key center. If you want to challenge yourself, look away from the screen in a moment, because I'm going to be showing which deviants are exemplar and which deviants are functional on the screen. So, are you ready? <clears throat> Let's do this. 
there's some kind of categorization process that happens uh, through your perception where you abstract the acoustic features of the stimulus into something that's a cognitive representation of the chord. That's abstract. In other words, you go from some sound to hearing something more abstract and complex, which is like A5 chord, which could have many different acoustic stimulations, but arrives at some some more abstract uh, uh, representation of A5 chord. If you had trouble telling the limes from the bananas, chances are you might not have that much experience in improvising. If, however, you were able to taste the citrus from the exemplar deviance, mm, you might have some experience with improvising. Ah, yes. It tastes like exemplar deviant. So what exactly is meant by taste the citrus? Well, improvisers have to train, like Andrew was saying, to hear chords more like ideas. G7 can mean different things depending on the key in which you find it. It can mean different voicings. It can mean different scales. It's more of a concept. Non-improvisers don't have to treat chords as concepts, and so it's harder for them to taste the citrus if we're going to continue belaboring this food analogy. The different steps along the way that get you there um, hypothetically have associated neural processes. And a lot of these neural processes we can detect by looking at the voltage fluctuations that are on the scalp. So for instance, if you play someone a sound that's unexpected, you can see a particular pattern of voltage fluctuations by placing electrodes on the scalp that correspond to hearing the unexpected thing. In terms of the theoretical ramifications of the research, I like to emphasize that studies about improvisation don't necessarily have to be concerned with things like novelty and spontaneity. There's a lot to think about in terms of how improvisers know about musical structures in a way that facilitates their ability to improvise. You know, and intuitively as a, as a musician, I know you know this, um, <laughs> and I myself know this too, there are times when you slip into and slip out of these these spaces, these knowledge spaces, where sometimes you're uh, you're just going along and you're playing whatever, and then other times where you really think about kind of nailing a certain line or getting a certain effect or something like that, and that that's a functional that's a functional thing. Right. But you're thinking about the magnitude of what it is that you're playing and how it impacts the other players and how it's going to add to the vibe that you know the band is is building you can imagine other analogies where knowing multiple solutions to a problem could make you more flexible in your ability to improvise solutions to situations in real life. It's not just music. If you look at other improvisatory behaviors in everyday life, like speaking or navigating, like if you know a language, it'd be very weird not to be able to improvise in that language. So it's hard to compare people who can improvise a language with people who speak a language but can't improvise. By looking at music, we're able to make that comparison and say something more general about creative ways of knowing. I like to think this in terms of Chop and big Food Network uh, fans. <laughs> in Chop, you get a basket, you don't know what's in the basket um, until you open it up and you see, and then you start to think about things in a functional, functional way. So if you have something like asparagus and fish, and something like jelly, or they sometimes they'll throw like potato chips <laughs> in there. You can think about the different functional properties of each of those ingredients, and you might come up with something like, oh, the potato chips can be used as a crust for the fish, the jelly can be a sauce for the asparagus, something like that. What's the jazz equivalent of jelly being a sauce for <laughs> I don't even know. I mean, it's like, it could be something like, uh, you know, a drummer just throws something, throws something weird at you, you know, you're in the middle of your solo and instead of um, continuing to play these blazing eighth notes, you, <laughs> you normalize. So like, you use like triplets or, you know, right. you, you do something, you do something to uh, kind of attenuate gotcha. um, to yeah. that to that environment. <laughs> um, <laughs> or you might, you know, if you're a guitar player and, and the drummer starts playing sizzles, you might, you know, use a whammy bar or something like that. That could be your sauce. It's just oh, something yeah. to complement uh, what's what's going on. But you find different functional ways of using, using your instrument, or in this case, using the ingredients to come up with a dish, you know, the dish is kind of like your logical conclusion. You start to create an associative library, right? So different ways of stretching that 
initial functional category into other, other realms. There are new and exciting studies of the brain coming out all of the time exploring how we experience music and how we play music, and I was very lucky to be part of one of these studies. As it so happens, musical neuroscience is a fairly new field of study. There's a lot of work left to be done. There are a lot of questions left to ask. <laughs> I think it's important to emphasize in this kind of research that a lot of the work is figuring out what question to ask. You can say, well, let's scan the brains and see what happens and see if we find any patterns. And that, that's a really good first step. It's also really important to have very specific theory-driven questions about what you might think would differ and why, and what, how it relates to real musical practices outside of the laboratory. It takes a lot of thought to think of the good questions as well. <laughs> so this is this is my band, the Hudson Horror. Well, I went to jazz school, okay. <laughs> um, but this is death metal. I'm a big, uh, you know, melodic <laughs> melodic death metal. So if you like In Flames or At the Gates or the Soil Work or any of those Gothenburg uh, <laughs> death metal bands, then you know this is this is where it's at. <laughs> <laughs>